Good evening, everyone. How you doing? I am thrilled to be here. I didn't bring any Kleenex. What am I thinking? I'm a weeper. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Santiago Curling. People call me Chago. And it has been an absolutely wonderful time with our Lebanon family. And I, I know it's a Wednesday night. And so one of the things I often just think to myself, you showed up. That's amazing. Everyone's busy. We have families. We have children. We have so many things happening in our lives. And uh, that you're here tonight uh, is a real honor. And I, I just hope that you're going to be encouraged by everything that happens tonight from the music, the testimonies, from God's word, all of it. And one of the things that I wanted to do um, to kind of get a run and start here before I get into our text today is I wanted to kind of take a little bit of time to to give maybe some people that are new to Lebanon or maybe some of you who have come in the middle of our journey at Lebanon, um, kind of a running start to kind of see what God has done over the years. And so I want to take a little bit of time to do that. And then I want to jump in to God's word and try to encourage you as best I can to really let the word of God show you something that is so so important and precious to me. So, the curlings in Lebanon. I'm really good at this. I'm going to talk and cry at the same time. And we, it won't go slow. I'm re- I am. I'm pretty good at it. And so, f- over 50 years of a partnership in the gospel. <sighs> It started um, when Dick Hester um, made a friendship with a young lady named Mary Jane Hayes. And uh, that's the lady there in the middle. And uh, early on in her uh, time at Bob Jones, they had a friendship there. And when my mother began trying to think about how to to get into Mexico, there was a lot of obstacles for her as a, a woman. Just so you know, there was just some things back there and some of those uh, thinkings and stuff like that, like a single woman shouldn't go by herself, and she had to kind of push against some of those things, but God eventually connected her with some wonderful supporters, and uh, Dick Hester here at Lebanon, I think maybe the first missionary he, he supported under his pastorship here, um, an amazing, amazing story. She was a, a wonderful woman, um, a pioneer, went guns a-blazing into Mexico, worked in such unique scenarios and situations, was a really brave and bold woman, a very broken background. Her father was an alcoholic. Her mother abandoned their family on a little farm in southern Indiana when she was 12 years old. She was a mama uh, really, really early. And how in the world How in the world did a little girl, in a little backwoods part of the country, Jesus found a way? She was super faithful and, uh, Again, she's just a different woman. And so early on, she was like walking the halls of hospitals or, or helping people um, all the time. And so people just thought like, this is a lady that you can lean on if things are not going well. And then that little picture you see is there's two girls there and then a little baby that she's holding. Those are my adopted brothers and sisters. She adopted a, a 13 and a 14-year-old pair of sisters who both parents had died. And she adopted my little not my little, the little baby in her lap. And uh, they gave, it, gave her to her in a shoebox. It's a, a great story that she used to tell me. They just gave her this baby in a shoebox and said the mom died on the way over here. And uh, God was able to place them in our family. That's my father there doing medical. They met, got married. That's a long story, but they did a really cool kind of team thing for in the 70s and most of the 80s. They were definitely a family on mission. That picture I love of my mother, she's around all these kids under a shade tree. That's kind of what her ministry was in some of the, the little villages that we would go to. That's her teaching in a, in a 
in a hot box, believe it or not. Those are like ovens there, but she would teach there while my dad was uh, attending to patients throughout the day. And that was kind of the early part of our life. They planted about seven churches at that time. She got sick. She had to move to the border, and there was a story to be told there. And you can see some more of my siblings in that picture. We had over 20 foster brothers and sisters in our home growing up. Again, I just think people thought, you know, that our home would be a place of refuge for them. Uh, Ahoy Captain is the only thing I can think of of myself in that middle picture. Where was the cruise ship? I don't know, but I was dressed for it. And, uh, and God was just so faithful to our family. And it's gone through some really tough times. I'm not here to talk about all the tough times, but our father left our family. And my mother got diagnosed with cancer. And it was a very, very, very difficult time in the early 90s for sure. God birthed a school in the middle of all of that. If you wanted to hear an update about how things are going in our ministry, that was this morning. I'm just trying to walk you through a journey with Lebanon um, and it's an amazing story. My mother passed away in 1998. Um, I, had, I had to go around. I remember being, it was being so difficult. I'm just a kid, you know. I was like 21 or something. And I go to churches all over the country. There was a lot of support. Support from my mom and dad, a lot. And I had to go to churches and tell them about how my mother had passed and my dad had left our family. And it was just a tough, ooh, a tough, tough year of doing that. And, uh, but God was faithful and he was really working in and through our lives. And, and Dick Hester had a huge uh, impact on me. And I know he probably thinks, how did I? I didn't talk to you that much. But uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, not trying to make you feel uncomfortable. So if you are, stop it. <laughs> Don't be, this is, I, I can't talk and not weep. I'm sorry. God's good grace, you know. We can speak into people's lives and we don't realize it. And uh, that's why I think we have to constantly be walking into every scenario, not complaining, not being negative. You just don't know what people are going through. We need to come in and give grace and to build up and to exhort. And uh, he spoke into my life. It's 22 years old. I was scared. Oof, I was so scared. And I didn't know how life would turn out. And he just, I think I spoke here. Pastor Dick, I think I spoke here. And uh, you came up to me afterwards. And uh, he just put his arm around me. And he goes, you're going to make it. God's given you the stuff to make it. And God's going to do something really special in your life. I needed to hear that. It kind of gave me some rocket fuel in me and I went back and I'm like okay God uh, somebody sees something in me and uh, let's go do this thing and so God's been very kind in how he's used Lebanon and he's given us three wonderful children Kirsten, Preston and Ashton they've been a ton of fun to raise and uh, I'm very thankful for them um, and they have relationships with a lot of your kids in here whether they've paired up on mission teams or just over the years made connections. Of course, my brother also partnered in our ministry with us, and he's been a joy to work with. He's very gifted. The guy is just uh, a lot of fun, and he's growing a young family, and it's exciting to see God using him in a really, really mighty way. So being to be able to partner together is a rare thing, and I'm thankful for it. And this 
this picture doesn't do justice to us. You think, wow, those are two good-looking guys. This is way more the way things are <laughs> with me and my brother, all right? That is almost every day, all day, twice a day. Um, the other one was just posed for a picture. He's a ton of fun. And I think of Lebanon, and there's so many formative and precious memories in my mind when I think of Lebanon over the years. And I try to scramble and find some pictures of, of LBC. And there's some fun memories of, of probably most of our school properties and buildings were built with Lebanon assistance and participation and partnership. Uh, of course, you guys know Art Humphrey. Even to this day, he probably comes down every year continually to support and help and encourage um, God, I can't put all the pictures in here of everybody. Sorry, Preston, I didn't get your approval for that one, but there you are. And so there's just so many different people, right, that have, have, have had a, a part in our life. And I, I think it's weird. I, I'll tell people about this church, and they kind of look at me like a dog, you know, when it doesn't know what's going on. Like, you know, they don't know what's going on. I'll say, man, there's people in that church that if my car broke down in Florida or North Carolina, like, I honestly... Have, I'm not embarrassed in the slightest bit to pick up the phone and say, come and help me out. And uh, one of those guys is Tom. Tom, I know that Tom would do anything for me. Um, I felt so bad, Tom. When I was like 20, maybe 24, we went into Mexico, and I know Pam, like, she lost her mind when we went, but um, we went, and we're supposed to have 350 kids. It turned out to be like 550, and it was just chaos, and, and literally, like, the, the wheels were coming off of this little BBS outreach, and I finally was just like, Tom, you're going to just, just walk by my side and do everything I tell you to do. And he was like a gopher. I probably made him like run back and forth, get Kool-Aid, buy cookies, get a van. Like the guy never stopped and he never stopped smiling either. And we just had a great partnership. And so there's lessons for me as I think of our 50-year journey with Lebanon of encouragement. <clears throat> and as, as was mentioned tonight, like you guys don't know what an encouragement you have been, right, to this church planner going out just don't think you can comprehend the years of encouragement, the commitment to, to the gospel, the commitment to missions is infectious. Like, I just want to go and take that to Redeemer Bible Church and be like, this is what I want to do. I want to pour all our resources and people into the kingdom. And I love your commitment. And there's just a legacy as I think about all the things that God has allowed us to partner in over the years. Dear, dear friends, and the next word is like very key for me. My wife, if you didn't come this morning, you missed a wonderful testimony. But we almost cannot think of Lebanon without thinking family. I, I just can't. I don't have another category. It's not a supporting church uh, just by itself. It's not just a, a really good church. It's, it's my family in, in many ways. And I'm very, very thankful for work. And if I think about it, I had to think about it. I don't get to do this very much, but I slowed down to think. And I said, what has God done over these years? I know for sure that my parents and myself have had a hand in 10 churches that have been planted in that time. And I cannot count how many more. Just one church that we were a part of in Monterrey, just one church. Out of that church, 13 brothers and sisters were saved. My mother was, is precious to them, really helped many of them. Just out of that has got to be at least 40 churches, just out of that church. And it's just an amazing thing to see the multiplication of gospel endeavor. We have a wonderful school at Macedonia. It's our discipleship school. It's, it's a, a unique and beautiful place that does a lot of good work. We have a discipleship intern program that is launching people all over the world. We just sent someone to Ireland. We had somebody in England. We have somebody in uh, New Hampshire. We have somebody else <clears throat> in Ohio. And God has done some amazing things through that. And then how can you ever put a number on the thousands of Christ followers? I just can't. Just the influence, right, of, of what God has done uh, through our partnership. And it's, I'm not throwing numbers out there for impress. Well, I want to impress you. Thousands of people know Jesus. Thousands. Not one or two. Thousands of people know Jesus because uh, of this partnership. And that's, 
an amazing thing. So curlings in Lebanon, all glory to God. All glory to God. All right, Chago, enough crying. Let's see if I can preach and run through this. Open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. I'm not going to exposit this passage. I'm just going to do the best I can to take out one principle that has meant the world to me, that has been very instrumental in my life in motivating me and pushing me to, to be a person on mission. So, I, and I hear you guys talking about it a lot. I can, I can hear that it's in your DNA, but the glorious treasure, beginning in verse 4 of 1 Peter. Let's read this together. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, I'm sorry, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor, this honor of counting Jesus as precious is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's go to the Lord and, and ask his assistance. Father God, I just thank you so much for this conference. I thank you, Lord, for where you continue to display and to teach and to reveal to us. I thank you, God, that we can just sit under the providential care and sovereignty of God, your shepherding as we go through this. So what are you teaching us? Nobody is here by accident. Nobody is here, God, just by happenstance. God, you are working out things in their life to make Jesus more real and to make your glory more apparent and God, to use them to have an impact in this world. And so I pray, God, that now your word would do that for us. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. The glorious treasure. I think there's been a call to join in the mission of God. <coughs> Missions is not just one of a hundred different biblical themes <coughs> that we might explore. The Bible is fundamentally about mission. And it's even the product of that mission. We're not just people who do missions, and I think this is what's kind of behind a little bit of the heart of what's going on. We don't do missions. We are the mission, right? Um, for God, but God himself is a missionary God, and we have the immense privilege in being incorporated into and involved in the mission of God. And I think there's a call that I have sensed uh, this week over that, that missions is there for God's glory, to make much of his name. We've been warned not to compartmentalize that, to not think that it's just somebody else's job, but it's, it's our job, it's everyone's job. We are all on God's mission. I really think about that call for discipleship that we heard on Sunday, a sense of, let's get to it. Write down a name. Who do you need to connect with? Who do you need to pray with? Who do you need to have on your heart? And I've enjoyed just the journey that we've been going. And we want to have a strategy here at Lebanon. We want to put our resources in the places that we think will have the most eternal impact. But it's not just about there or you know, strategy as a church, but it's about you and, and how you live your life. And is this mission of God your mission as well? And the fact of the matter is I just get really real with people very quickly. Why are we not missional? Why do we struggle so much, right, in understanding that we need to share the gospel? Why, why do we struggle at times to count, you know, this cost and go, whoa, that seems a little heavy. It would, it would take so much of my energy, time, resources to do something like that. Why do we struggle to share Christ? I'm just going to tell you, I struggle to share Christ. And if every one of your pastors would tell you, yeah, we do too. There, it's not this easy thing to just 
come out of your mouth and your heart in different scenarios? Why at times is there a struggle? And I've really asked God and meditated over the years on, God, give me a breakthrough. Give me a, a, a motivating factor that would help me break through that. Why do we have a hard time submitting to God's mission? We know what he's about. We know what he wants to accomplish. We know what he wants to do, but it's a battle. <clears throat> and for many of you, even when we think of about a missions conference or where there's an, an exhortation, right, to share the gospel, why am I driven by guilt? Like what's driving me to even want to share right now or participate is not grace. It's not his goodness. It's not his glory. I'm just going to be straight up honest. What's really driving me right now is guilt. I should be doing these things. And I want to help us tonight through God's word on how to have our hearts motivated in a pure and clean way, in a way that would make you not only be driven to be a part of the mission, but be honored to even have a part in it. And so we're going to take a look at understanding value. No, it's not a typo the worth-ship problem that we all have. This is one of the reasons why we struggle, how to embrace the treasure. And then I just want to be really practical at the end and give you some practical implications of valuing Jesus. What happens in your life? What does it look like? How will your night be different tonight if Jesus becomes your glorious treasure that he's meant to be? Let's get into it. Understanding value. Value is a glory thing. So when I think of value, when I think of thinking that this thing is important, that this thing is worthy of me spending money on, if this is, is something I should put my time into. My thinking is that it's a glory thing. And I know, Chago, how do you put value and glory together? Hold on, you'll see. As was pre uh, preached on Sunday morning by Scott about glory. You know, I don't like Christianese. Glory, holiness, all that. Like, unless you really understand it, sometimes it sounds like that. And maybe some of you are in here, You've been attending for a few weeks or a friend has brought you and you hear a lot of this lingo. So what does it mean? So the word glory is significant or weight or value. It's something that, that is bigger, that's, that, that owns the space versus you. So when you see, um, you know, everyone uses big examples. Like you see a majestic mountain. That's what you said, a big mountain, right? The glory of, of the Himalayas, right? That it's, it's glorious because it's the most significant, it's the, the biggest, it's the grandest. And we have things like this. And it, the way it works for me is, is standing around Josh Rowland. I grabbed his arm the other day. It was a glorious arm. <laughs> I was like, this guy works out, all right? He felt significant and I felt small. That's a glorious moment, believe it or not. There's value that I put there, like it's a good thing to be in shape, okay? And so... Value is a glory thing. And so when I think of, of, of glory for me, I think of a pebble versus a boulder in a lake. I throw a pebble into the lake, a few ripples. And then I get a massive rock and this big old thing and the whole water is dispersed and moved. That's a glorious thing. Something more significant, something more weighty is having an impact, right? In a practical sense, the advice on the big decision. So you have to make a big decision. You talk to three or four guys and then all of a sudden this one guy speaks into your life and tells you, I think you should take the job. And you almost just, yes, I should. And you walk away. And believe it or not, you esteemed value to that person over somebody else. And his word meant more to you. It was a glorious response by you. And so I'm trying to put feet to this concept of glory. So this is why you listen to them because they had more value to you, more glory, more significance. And the fact is, whoever you give the most glory to, that's, that's a, a response that takes place in your life. And so this is important as you read this passage with me, because the word kept coming up, chosen and precious, chosen and precious. Then later on, to declare the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the light. And I really believe that God perfectly acknowledges what is truly glorious, valuable, and precious. And what he values, what God esteems as the most valuable thing in the universe is Jesus, his son. To him, he goes, I value my son as chosen and precious. And you see that in verses 4, verse 6, and 7. 
And God is the most valuable thing in the universe. And he shows us in a, in a sense or gives us an understanding of what really should be the most valuable, glorious thing in Chago's life. It should be his son. And we have to understand this value thing because just so you know how the Trinity is working right now, the Trinity is continually trying to outdo each other and glorifying, glorifying each other. The like, ultimate reality, like forget this universe, forget planets, forget earth, forget everything. There's God. God the Father, Son, and Spirit. And they are perfectly relationally connecting to one another. They serve one another. They esteem one another. They delight in one another. They serve in a way you, you see it throughout the scriptures. Like when you read the New Testament and see how Jesus is functioning, there's just, I remember going like, this doesn't make any sense to me. And then I realized the light bulb came on like, oh yeah, they will never, ever, ever, ever focus on themselves. Jesus never said one word while he walked on his ministry here on earth that he said, I did not speak it other than on behalf of the Father. And God, the Trinity, is continually trying to outdo each other and glorifying each other. I think of John 12, 28. Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. Jesus is petitioning his Father to do that. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Because he understands that this issue of understanding value, like at the essence of what reality is all about, is somehow valuing, glorifying, exalting in something. And we have a worship problem, point two. Since we are made to value and cherish the most precious and glorious things, we're created that way. We're made that way in the image of God to be able to go, this is valuable. This is worthy. This is good. We're made for that. And we are glory hungry people. And basically what Romans 1 teaches us is that we tend to go after the lesser glory ourselves. Our agenda and our, our advancement and our convenience and our comfort and our success and our security become things that are extremely glorious to us, that we put the highest value on. And the greater glory that we hunger for is this glory that we have in God himself. And this is really what the problem is for most of us. It's my problem. And it literally comes down to like super practical little things. Why I make a decision to stay a little longer and talk to somebody why I book it out, why I don't respond to a text, it will be literally a glory issue. Chago's comfort is far more important than God's glory at this time. And it, it, it shakes it, right? And it, it pushes up against that and it reveals itself in very practical, uh, natural, everyday circumstances. Like I thought this was very interesting. It was a survey of public students in a high school. I really thought that stood out to me. And <clears throat> it said 18% of like, they were asking him, what, what would you want your life to, to look like? 18% listed achieving fame or public recognition in a public high school. 25% working in a higher paying job. 96% said making a difference in the world. 82% having one marriage partner for life. That's the ideal for a high school kid. 77% said having a clear purpose for living. Where does this come from? Where does this show up? It's because we're made for significance. We're made to, to do glorious things, substantial things, and we don't. See, we are made for eternity and for purity and for holiness. We're made for God himself. <laughs> we're made to be in the beauty of his splendor. We're made to be there. And this is why the words that you read in there, we're a royal priesthood, a chosen people. We have an acceptable life. Our sacrifices are acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. We want to have that sense of awe and significance and wonder and yes, life matters. And sadly, our problem is we give value and glory to many lesser things like ourself, worldly ideals, people, 
etc. Again, I want to talk to maybe somebody in here who's like a seeker or maybe you're a little skeptical or you don't know what this Christian thing is all about. And then maybe that resonated with you like, yeah, I, I want a life that matters. I don't want to look back when I'm 50 years old and go, man, I, I did nothing. God has made you for the most significant, significant thing in the world. And people, and I think you can relate, choose to live selfishly and choose to have their agenda above God's and never give God his time and his due. And I think you can relate to that. And this worth, worth of, worth-ship problem leads to this problem about value. And I will give you three things that I think have to happen in a Christian's life to begin turning the corner in this area. And that is that you wake up to it. Why can I share the gospel? Why can I live for God? Why can I make those decisions? Well, being awake to his glory and his value and his significance, is, I think, is the first step. Once you begin to grasp the magnitude of what you're dealing with, with God himself, the greatest, right, and holiest being, that is the first step. And then it leads to have an effect on you. It needs to get into you. It needs to make you be challenged. I remember uh, Tim Keller has a famous sermon on Isaiah 6, and he talks about this. He goes, it, it is natural when Isaiah sees God in his vision, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, that he thinks of himself immediately as vile, wicked, and undone. Guys, that happens to us on just a practical, everyday level. You know, I mean, I remember one time I was at a music competition, and I had a young man next to me, and we were waiting outside of a hallway, waiting for somebody, and they were playing, you know, we heard music in there, and he was playing the piano, and this, man, this kid was amazing. I didn't know who was in there, and I was like, whoa, this kid is unbelievable. They're, they're going to win the competition. So I have my senior boy next to me, and out walks a little snot-nosed eighth grader, about this big. I literally saw my senior boy come undone in that glorious moment. I'm a nobody. Why am I here? Right? Like, when we're around even human greatness, right, we just almost come unraveled. And when we begin to see the preciousness and the glory of God, it has to get into you and it begins to unravel you. And I hope that you will respond in a fitting manner. I love the word fitting. It was fitting, right? It's a fitting thing. It's the appropriate response. We need to walk in accordance to the glorious reality of what we have. And so my call, as we take a look at this passage and think of what it's teaching us, and God of the universe is looking at his son and calling him chosen and precious and repeats that. And we get the privilege to be able to connect to that, to know what is the most glorious, precious thing in the universe. And we need to wake up to it. It needs to affect us. It needs to have a fitting response in us when we see the glory that is there. So what does that look like? I think in my mind, for someone to see something glorious and then respond in a a effective and an appropriate way, in a fitting way, it's like walking on the edge of a path in the mountains in a lifting fog. You're on this hike, you're enjoying the cool day, there's this really thick fog, you know, whistle while you work, this guy. And then the fog lifts, and little does he know that he has been walking on the edge of a drop to his death. His glorious and proper response would be to be affected by that, to hug the wall to respond in a fitting way to this glorious reality that his life was on the line. Or I think of awakening to the value of your grandma's china bowl during the Super Bowl party. Hey, yes ma'am, go Chiefs. Yeah, we're having a blast. There's cheese dip in your bowl. Wait, that bowl's worth $100,000. You better gloriously respond to that reality. And I'm just trying to put this very practically because we respond when we get value and see value and we respond for earthly things like the value of a china bowl. 
or walking too close to an edge that could lead to danger. The appropriate and fitting response to the treasure that Jesus is proclaiming the excellencies of him. There's nothing else more fitting than to see the glory of Jesus and then be a proclaimer of that. And this is what I don't get. This is what used to just, ah, oh, irk Chago so much. Like, I'm a Christian. And to talk about Jesus and his goodness can be so hard. Not here. This is easy peasy. There's an outline. There's an agenda. There's a warm crowd. But put me in like coaching a basketball game at a tournament. Sitting around a bunch of pretty rough people in a coach's, uh, coach's um, hospitality room. All of a sudden, I get really gun shy about declaring the excellencies of him. And it embarrasses me. And it frustrates me. And it has for years. Because I have a worship problem. I love me. I love how people perceive me. I care very deeply that I don't ruffle anybody's feathers. That's more glorious to me than Jesus is. Flat out. That's exactly what's happening in those moments. And so I want to lead you now on how to embrace this treasure. And I think verse 7 is so amazing to me. Like to me it's the key to like at least open the door. Poquito. Like just, just a little bit. In the NIV, it says, now to you who believe, this stone is precious. God already thought it was precious, has declared it to be so in his word. But you who believe, <laughs> you think he's precious as well. It says it in the KJV, and to you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. And then in the ESV, it says, so the honor is for you who believe. Because actually in the Greek here, it's very complicated. And it almost has a sense in it that if you even get a glimpse of the glory of Jesus, whoa, you are in exclusive territory. Because you believe, then Jesus gets to be precious to you. And the idea is what an honor. What an honor. That you can glimpse the beauty of Christ and it means something to you. The eternal glorious thing that the God of the universe is saying, my son is precious, he's so amazing. And you and I in some small way on this earth get to be a part of that. And how does that happen, Chago? I think it happens in two ways. In seeing Jesus and valuing Jesus. Let me kind of walk you through the two of these things. I promise you I'm going fast. Seeing him, seeing him. There's a guy named, um, it's a weird name. I could, I've had like three spellings for him. But Zinzendorf, he was a Moravian. He started this massive missionary movement. I've been very influenced by his biography and stories. And one time he was looking at a painting. And you know, I think it was titled The Crown of Thorns. And as he was meditating on this painting of Jesus and this crown of thorns, this thought hit him and he wrote in his journal, these wounds are meant to purchase me. These drops of blood were shed to obtain me. And I know I've had students just cry with me and go like, I don't see Jesus like that. Why, why does my classmate bring Christ up and is just so moved and I just, I, I can't make it happen. Of course, only the spirit can. But it looks like that. It looks like this awakening to who Christ is and what he has done. See, there's a fitting response to this glory of God and very soon before, before he began this Moravian missions movement, he wrote, I have loved him for a long time, but I have never actually done anything for him. From now on, I will do whatever he leads me to do. And I think this is what it looks like when we get a glimpse of the glory of Christ, the value of who he is, 
the only fitting response is to go like, I need to do something. I need to demonstrate with my life that he is precious and valuable and glorious. So I think it's something about seeing Jesus, and I pray that with people, and then valuing him. And I I always kind of do three things. When people say, I'm a Christian, I was talking to some of you who maybe are not Christian. I'm going to talk to people who say, "I'm, I'm a Christian. I've accepted Christ. I've trusted in him. But I'm really struggling with this concept tonight. It's worth everything. I just don't get it. I think you plead with God to see the preciousness of Jesus. Jesus, the Holy Spirit is more interested in you seeing Jesus for who he is than you are. And so you just start saying, I want to know Jesus like this. I want to have an an understanding of who he is. He is not where he should be in my heart and life. And just start pleading. Two, investigate why you do not find Jesus valuable. Something else is more glorious to you than Christ. And you just need to go on that journey, whether it's idol, discovery, whether, whatever. I don't know. But you got to find out. And don't look for it by your own self, like, perception. Look on it on what your behavior. Your behavior will display what you value. You, you love comfort. You snap at your children when they get in the way of that. You love convenience. You love security. Like, when you hear these mission stories and church planners going, like, what grips your fear? What's the first thing that grips your fear? That's probably the thing that you find more valuable than Christ. I could never move away from my friends. I could never move away from grandma, my family. That's more glorious to you, possibly, than Christ is. So you've got to find out what you have put in that place and then discover who Jesus is. I tell people, I want you to read the Bible. I want you to go and like read the Gospel of Mark. And sometimes I'll just say like, let's have one lens. There's a lot of lenses. I want one lens. Like read every time Jesus asks a question. I want you to circle it. I want you to meditate on it. I want you to write in your journal stuff. I just want you to stare at Jesus for a month. And I want you to write down every time he asks a question and just go like, why did he ask that? What's he up to? It wasn't a lack of information, right? And I just want him to go on a journey of staring at Christ. Little will you know, like, and there's a lot of questions you can use to to have as your lens every time he manifests, right, his deity or whatever. But you need to discover. John Piper says, our faith means not only believing a truth about Jesus, but finding a treasure. Loving Jesus is treasuring him and setting our hearts on discovering more and more of who he truly is. That's the journey. I'm going to give you two quotes. Like these are the kind of things that make me just kind of like, whoa, what a savior. Spurgeon says, he looked down at the people he was dying for. Some cringing like cowards, some snarling like dogs, all clueless and blind to what he was doing. And in the greatest act of love in history, He stayed. (laughs) Like, what wonder is is there just in that? If you just meditate on that, the Holy Spirit will help you go, wow, what a precious Savior. (laughs) What a precious Savior. And this one bothers a lot of people at times. It's from Sinclair. And he, he, for those of you maybe that don't know Christ in here, like this one will be very fitting for you. Because he said, like, just think about what happens on the cross. Like, an outsider looking at what happens to Jesus. When we think of Christ dying on the cross, we are shown the links to which God's love goes in order to win us back to himself. We would almost think that God loved us more than he loves his own son. We cannot measure such love by any other standard. He is saying to us, I love you this much. The cross is the heart of the gospel. It makes the gospel good news. Christ died for us. He has stood in our place before God's judgment seat. He has borne our sins. God has done something for us on the cross that we could never do for ourselves. But God does something to us as well as for us through the cross. He persuades us that he loves us. 
Like, you, you just got to meditate on that stuff. I, I mean, without me knowing more theology, just me from the outside looking in, I'm like, God must love me more than he loves his son. Because he slaughtered him. And he didn't respond to him in the garden. And I know it's not true. He loves his son perfectly. But it makes you just have a wonder of who Christ is and what he's accomplished. And so there's practical implications that I just want to walk you through and I'll be done. See, it's easy to share, easy to share what you cherish. This is what I learned. You guys want to talk basketball? Let's do it right now. You don't have to twist my arm. If you told me we're going to talk basketball till midnight, I go, let's go for it. I got to get up at five, but so what? Because what I cherish is easy for me to talk about. And is that not absolutely convicting? Because some of us can't even say the word Jesus in a place other than this place. Oh my word. We value him so little that I can't say his name in any other context. Do you get me? It's so, so shameful on our part and so awakening. I want to tell something to mom and dads. I say this to a lot of people in my church. We go to church. We take our kids to church. We hang out with them. We read them a Bible story. I encourage you. Now, don't, don't resist just because they toggled, said it. Oh, I, I got to figure this out on my own so it comes for me. Just humble yourself. Plan a time. Sit down and look across at your kids. Just so we're clear. And just so you know, and we don't assume it, I love Jesus with all my heart. A lot of our kids have never heard mom and dad say that. Isn't that just kind of blow your mind for a little bit? They've heard me say I love my wife a thousand times. And I just wanted to bring this. I love Jesus. We will respond in a more fitting manner to the glory of God. When we see it, sure, let's do this. Let's go serve this way. Let's respond. And I just want to encourage you that if you are seeing the preciousness of Jesus, his glory is filling your life, then your life should look like this. And I don't know where I got it. I wish I could give it to that guy. I don't know. Live in a way that demands a gospel explanation. Just think about what I said there. Live in a way that demands a gospel explanation. Here's, this is big. Can you explain how you live your life without bringing up the gospel? If you can, I got married at 22. I worked this job because it was really a good one. I found a really good community in my church and people just nod their head and go, okay. Sounds like every other life. And you don't have to bring up Jesus at all. You ain't living right. You're not doing it right. If you cannot express the gospel in the explanation of your life to another person, you're not doing it right. You must say like, I know this is going to be a little awkward, but I'm a Christian. And the reason I work these two jobs is because I do this and I always have to be off on Sundays because I love being in my church and I like serving God. Like if you can't bring up God in the explanation of why you do what you do, we're not doing it right. Right? And so that's important. I want to end with this story. I got to, to go to a really weird anniversary service for my church, a church that my, my mother planted. And there's not the picture of my mom. She was a little younger there. And then there's a picture. It's hard to see. But I'm sitting at that kitchen table for like four hours till like two in the morning. Mexican food, salsa. Let's go, man. It was awesome. Precious elderly people there that uh, my mother led to the Lord. And I just, I wish I really would have recorded it. Like, I'm, I want to take a sabbatical one time for like three months and just record those people, you know. And I, I said, what made the difference? Like, when did you know, you know, that, that my mom was like, for real? And she said, it was the first Christmas in 1970. Your mother came in. 
She brought little chorus books. She brought some gifts for the kids. We were all shocked. She said she was going to be here, but we thought no way would this gringa show up. And she shows up, and we're all kind of in awe because the family's everything to the Hispanic culture. And she's like, why is this lady here on Christmas Day? And then this, mi tia Berta, she just goes, what are you doing here? Don't you wish you were at home and with your family? And my mom said, there's no place I'd rather be. It sounds so simple. But it literally broke down all the walls in that family's life. This person cares about us. This person here is on a mission. This person has something to tell us. She goes, she gained credibility, credibility to us on that Christmas day. And uh, the Moravians have a famous saying when two young missionaries kind of gave themselves over to slavery to go work on an island full of slaves that needed the gospel. And it's just always stuck with me. I think Matt Papa wrote a song about it. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. I don't know all your lives and hearts, but I know for me, the thing that's kind of pushed me through and wanted to share Jesus and wanted to waste my life for him and wanted to pour it out and be a drink offering like I read in the Bible has been the preciousness of Christ. He is worthy. He's worthy. And I encourage you to just think about that in your own life. Because I think if he's precious to you, then every mission movement in here, every gospel outreach initiative that happens this year, if Jesus is precious to you, you'll be like, Let's go do this thing. I know this is embarrassing. Nobody in my office knows I'm a Christian. And I've been there for 10 years. This is embarrassing. But Jesus is so precious. I'm going to write that letter. And just say, I know I've never told you this. But I love Jesus. And if you ever want to talk about it, I'm willing to have a cup of coffee with you about it. That's my admonition to you, Lebanon. I love you. I thank you. Let's pray.